All right, so welcome, uh, Maker Campers. I'm Nick Raymond, the camp director. Welcome to week six of Maker Camp. Uh, today is Maker Monday, and we're here with Jimmy Duresta talking about some of his mad making skills. Hello. Um, we were trying to figure out earlier to say what his intro would be, and simply he makes stuff. And so he'll be talking to us about that. That's um, it. <laughs> so hey, Jimmy, how's it going? Very we're good. Also Thanks being for having today, me. Uh, what was that? Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, we're also being joined today by Kate and Laura, uh, both from the Google Hi. Austin uh, headquarters. How's it going, guys? Hello. Hi. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> and Nick? there he comes back. We've got Courtney and Meg going on in the Make Labs area. Uh, Hi. How's it going? Good. So today we're doing uh, bookmaking. I think you have some materials that you're going to make some books uh, follow along, have Jimmy show us yeah. some steps. And uh, Laura, I think you've got a finished project already. Um, yes, I do. So Book. Very nice. Uh, to start <laughs> off, uh, we'll just go into how we know Jimmy. Uh, a while back, one of our friends, Joe, saw Jimmy's cool license plate uh, on the Discovery Channel. Uh, so we sent him a tweet, and um, we invited him to have some paella with us at the, uh, the, world's, right. uh, the World Maker Fair in uh, NYC. Um, yeah. He's been a good friend ever since. In fact, he's actually, uh, congratulations, Jimmy, you've uh, joined on to make some videos for us and tutorials for Make. Yes. So look forward to yes. that. Thank you. And yeah, um, let's get the hang. I left my keys hooked to my, my backpack in the other oh. room. But I happen to. I have this key. This is the one key for my workshop in New York City. It's uh, two-ended. It's got a key on each end. And then it has these cool flip-outs for the padlocks on the doors. So oh, very cool. It's kind of hard to see. Is that a cool uh, custom setup, or do you buy that somewhere? No, no, no. Totally made by me. I make them all the time. They break often because, you know, they're a little bit long sometimes. And... Uh, they wear out, locks change, so it's a constant upgrade all the time. And as they get upgraded and uh, locks change, I have a wall in my apartment, which I'm not at right now, but in my apartment I have a wall and there's like maybe 50 different keys on it, all custom oh. star keys that I've made over the years. And you know, maybe one day they'll be in a museum. <laughs> now they're, they're in my own private collection. A collection? Why don't you just keep on like a big key ring? Is there a reason you don't have just like a massive uh, chain of keys? Oh, no, no. Like, as locks retire, as apartments change, I just retire the key and make a new one most Very of cool. the time. Like this one, though, I've repaired it 50 times because I'm too lazy to make a new one. One of these wow. days, I'll make a new one and retire this one. <laughs> but, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a, my own little personal piece of art that I carry around. I have another star key, which is a three-prong. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the one that people see the most on, on the Internet. It's, even, it's in my maker video that Nat and Brooklyn made. Cool. Awesome. Yep. Do you have like a, a story about a heart key as well? Brooklyn's telling me about. Oh yeah, I I've made heart keys in the past. Actually, that was a friend of mine. She, uh, a friend of mine, my 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 good friend. Uh, she works for. The name escapes me. It'll come to me. It's a it's a company like um, anthropology. It's like uh, kind of like real organic stuff for for women. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, she's like so full of love, my friend Brianna, and she's like, "Could you make me a key?" And she's always like bobbling with like when you see her hearts are like coming off of her so <laughs> it, it just occurred to me to just make a key for her with a heart top and uh, and ever since then I've been making them for other people everyone has seen it and said make me one make me one Valentine's Day was mm -hmm. kind of popular I made mm -hmm. a bunch last year when the show was on because a lot of people were, were searching me and finding pictures of this heart key and so people were buying them for their wives and girlfriends cool. so uh, what show was that Jimmy you're on a couple shows right yeah, I did a few shows in the last 10 years. I mean, I could start the chronological order. 10 years ago, I did a show with my brother called Trash to Cash, where we find garbage, and we use that to make it into cool things to decorate rooms. And each one of the shows, we decorated a room for a specific event that would take place on that episode. It was The show was a bit farcical, although everything I built was real and legitimate, but there was a real tongue-in-cheek with the whole show. It was a lot of fun. And we did that for FX, and then came a show called Hammered, on uh, the Home and Garden Network, where, again, it was about me making stuff, not necessarily from trash. And then I did a small show called Against the Grain, which was very similar to Hammered, but without my brother. 
And then uh, we most recently, John and I, my brother again, we did a show called Dirty Money. With okay, lit up the flea cool. market. Yeah. And now, and that, now I have my video series on make where I make things in three minutes. On dinner. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it took way longer than that to actually make it, but yeah. <laughs> Got it. Cool. So, Am I doing uh, okay? We... Can you guys see me, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you before we get started oh, with the okay. tutorial, uh, what's the deal with the Spider Man all behind you? Uh, where are you at right now? <laughs> Oh, right on. I, I am uh, currently doing a, a few months of a gig at a toy company called Basic Fun, oh, cool. and I am uh, one of the product development guys here. I'm helping them. I'm trying to infuse some new thinking, some fresh ideas, and I am in their showroom, and one of the things we do here at this company is make uh, plush for for mm -hmm. amusement. So right now, the variety of different Spider-Mans you could buy for your amusement park. <laughs> <laughs> and we also we also make uh, the the plush that goes into a crane machine. So if you see crane machines at uh, Walmart and Target and these type of places, we make the machine and we also make the the fulfillment. So there's three divisions here at this place. It's called the Good Stuff Basic Fun is the name of the company. Those are the two names of the basic uh, basic fun and Good Stuff are the names of the companies. Do they make the ones in the cranes more slippery? Absolutely. <laughs> you can't get them. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, I when I was I was amazed to find out when I started working here that they actually fulfill these cranes every couple of weeks. I'm like, nobody gets anything out of those things. Are you serious? <laughs> it's like the same product that's been sitting there for the last 20 years. They go, no, 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 no. People get stuff out of them all the time. They have to replenish them every two weeks all around the United States. They have like little people that, that work for them that do that and get the cash. They get the cash and they put more products in. <laughs> Have you found secrets yet to like use the claw and like pick things up? Do you know, other people at the work that know the secrets ins and outs? <laughs> no, but the, the technicians do have an ability to uh, set the uh, you know the the win ratio. I think you know of course it all depends on who selects what to drop the crane and stuff. But mm -hmm. I think there is a win ratio that they could they could you know somewhat adjust. Wow. Cool. Yeah, I think. I think there's something to that effect. I wasn't listening in that meeting. <laughs> I was tweeting. I was tweeting with my friends at Make. <laughs> nice. Much better use of your time. Much yeah. better use. Yeah. <laughs> so should we go into the uh, the tutorial? I know Meg and uh, Courtney have some materials. Sure. Yeah. Some instructions. Where are you guys at right now, Courtney? We are at the gluing stage of our paper. So we're okay. just trying to bind our paper together. Oh right on, and you. It seems like you put the wooden, the wood in there. between the, the rather the papers in between wood with the clamps. Yeah, yes. we put it in between um, some uh, printed circuit boards so that we can work on our wood uh, cover. cover. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you have something rigid that's going to clamp that that packet Perfect. of paper. You know, I'm using I'm using my book the end, but that that pack of paper that's you know subject to being wobbly and crooked. You don't want it to be crooked either, like that. You know, into the clamps. Yeah, yeah. Because that glue will, if you if you glue it and it's crooked, that's how it will always stay. It's important to have like a consistent pressure across the whole back of that packet of paper. And what kind of glue is the best kind of glue to use? We just use basically Elmer's glue all. Is that? Oh, okay. Well, you know, the reason why you, it, it's totally fine in this case, because if you're going to grab the binding, let me use my, my little post-it note to show you. If you're going to grab the binding back here, it's okay because it's going to fold from here like that. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to make a typical book like the book in my other video where it opens like this, uh, yeah. you, see that, you see that rainbow that occurs at the back of the book right there? Yeah. At the back of the binding? I call that the rainbow right here at the bottom. Yeah. If that's a hard glue, it's going to crack. And then you'll open the book and it'll break. Uh, that needs to be a PVA or a soft glue called jade glue or PVA. J glue or PVA. Okay, right. got it. Thanks. So, Thanks. like I said, in the instance today where you're going to grab the binding a couple inches away from the glue joint, you're okay. Yeah. But when you want to get that rainbow effect at the back of the book inside of a typical binding, you need to use PVA or jade glue because it's flexible, and that's the most important thing to keep in mind. Got okay, it. correct. Um, typically, like what PVA or jade glue is, is if you've ever gotten like a little notepad, like beside a telephone, and you could tear the pages off one at a time, and it seems like wax is on the back. That's that's yeah. jade, that's jade glue. It's always a little soft and stretchy. Got it. Yeah. 
that's a jade glue that you could see with your naked eyes. Does that kind of glue take longer to set than regular glue? No, it actually dries. It dries in pretty good time. I mean, that's okay. why in my video, uh, people ask me how long was the whole entire video. Probably from start to finish is probably about forty minutes worth of work. Mm -hmm. So I glue the book right away. I glue the binding right away. And in mm -hmm. and in the video that we're talking about, where I make the wooden covers, mm -hmm. the reason I glue it is just so it makes it more manageable. Typically, you don't have to glue it if you're going to grab it with two nuts and bolts. But I do it just to make the pack manageable and so that the pack stays together and nice and even. Because you'll notice the holes I drill for the bolts still have some slack in them. And if the bolts were loose, these papers would, would shift around and then they wouldn't stay consistent, nice square corner. You're right. So that's why I glue it. The very first thing I do is glue it and then I set it aside to dry. So 30 minutes later when I'm ready to put them in the wood, it's ready to go. It's like, you know, you put the bread in the oven while you're busy preparing the other part of dinner. <laughs> So, right. Jimmy, how did you learn so much about bookbinding? I thought you were more of like a metalworking uh, woodshop kind of guy. That's a funny story. A student of mine, I teach at the School of Visual Arts now for about 18 years, and my new class is going to start in September. I have students that come back and show me the disciplines that they learned. And one of my students about 10 years ago came back. She came to me and said, hey, can I teach bookbinding to show your students what I learned? And I said, sure. So she came in and did a bookbinding class, and I just watched her, and that was how I first learned. And uh, from there, I, I, I started having her come in like uh, maybe she came in to teach about four semesters in a row. And then she was unavailable one semester, and then I just started doing it myself and showing the students how to do it. And then that's how I just kept doing more and more for myself. It was really rewarding the first time I did it, and I said, wow, I just made a book. This is incredible. And uh, so I started making more and more <laughs> books, and now, now typically I make my own sketchbooks. I mean, when I, when I have the time to relax and like think about something I, I usually make a new sketchbook and now when I n most often I make my sketchbook in a demo for my students so that when I'm done I keep it it's for, it's for me <laughs> so very cool and how did you get uh, into the teaching aspect of it I went to the School of Visual Arts in the 90s actually in the 80s I graduated in 1990 and um, about two years after I graduated my mentor at school invited me back to teach and he wanted me to teach specifically materials because that was the one thing that I was always so curious about I would constantly be buying materials and experimenting and uh, so even when I had no reason for it just to kind of increase my vocabulary of materials and that's what I call it to my students I say you gotta increase your vocabulary if you know how to you know use scissors and a razor blade that's good but what if you knew how to use scissors a razor blade and a paper chopper or a die cutting machine or this or that. Those are extreme examples, but the point is is the more you know, the more you can do. And the more disciplines you know, the more you can cross reference your disciplines. Like a book binding and a wooden cover, for instance, I do woodwork. So uh, it's just uh, what I encourage my students to do is just the more you the more you learn how to do things, the more freedom you have to create. Awesome. And how is, uh, so this book binding process you learned from actually one of your previous students, how is it different from like a traditional book binding you might see? I know you talk about the wood cover, different materials. Well, I'll tell you, um, my student showed us the traditional book binding process by making packets of signatures is what it's called. And I've done that, but uh, I'm usually, I, I tend to like want to get things done quickly. <laughs> so... Have you seen uh, book, typical book binding people, uh, book binders would use what's called signatures and you take a packet of paper. If you look at the back of a book you'll notice you take a packet of paper and there's several packets of paper stacked on top of one another and each one of them is kind of sewn yeah. together. Like I said, I've done that before in the past and uh, it just, it's a little time consuming. In my first video on my YouTube channel where I folded the pages and then I binded those pages together it's just a fast way of getting like one big packet of paper. Um, I started doing that because I used to actually do photographs. I would make a photograph book and I would take a big printed piece of paper that's a photograph and I would fold it so that it's oh. and when you open up the page it's the full photograph. Oh, cool. and, then, and then I would do the other one and then ultimately I would spray glue these two pages back to back so you'd have like an image here I'm drawing it. I'm drawing an image. Can you see that? You can't yeah. See that. Nice heart circle. <laughs> yeah. And then I'd have an image here, which is like a square. 
right? Mm-hmm. So imagine those are two photographs back to back. And then once the whole back was binded, I would then lightly spray glue these two pages together. And I'd go through the whole book like that. Typically, it wouldn't be as thick as this. There would be smaller photo books. And I started making these photo books for myself, my friends, and my family. And then one day, I realized if I just used plain paper, I would have a journal. Yeah. And so that's how I started that technique of just folding the pages and, and coming up with a, a book that's half of an 8.5 by 11, a stack of folded papers. Now, the purists, I get a lot of people asking me, don't, don't your books break in half because I'm not using the signatures properly? Um, if I abuse the book, it probably wouldn't last as long as a book with typical signatures. But the books I make are typically for me. I'm not trying to sell them. And if it did break, which they very rarely do, I could just glue it back together myself. So they said it's a fast way for me to make a journal for myself. If I was going into mass production, I would certainly use the proper signature method so that they sure. last for But they're more for you, it sounds hundreds like hundreds of years. Yeah. yeah, I mean I make books for me and my friends. When you do the photograph uh, when I do the photograph books and I spray glue the pages back to back, the, the books last really, really long time. So do you sketch a lot? It sounds like you make a, quite a few of these sketchbooks. Now you're using the, the blank paper instead of the photos. Um, uh, do you yeah, I go through in designs, or how does that work? Uh, I go through probably about two sketchbooks a year, and I, I have typically I have different sketchbooks for different subjects. Like this sketchbook is just for everything. Like I try and keep all my current events going on in my books. Um, this is going to be some future videos I'm going to make. I just sent Gareth these pictures. I'm going to make a tiki head bank. See that? <laughs> cool. In the next couple of days, I'm going to make a, a tool bag on my sewing machine. See that? Um, and this book is my book at work. I decided to use this book. It's going to be because every five minutes there's a meeting. And so I got to remember. <laughs> I gotta pretend like I'm listening and like <laughs> So this is gonna be my this is my my new journal for work. Yeah, I have um, like one of these little like make notebooks. Um, I have yet to make my own, but I'm hoping to. Uh, I want to use graph paper actually because it has like the cool grid paper for like designs and sketches. But Absolutely, I use it a lot yeah. for like technical drawings. You draw yeah, out like sure. the different dimensions and use different colored pens. Um, and I feel like yeah. fast, but. Sherry sent me one of those. I have it right on my desk. I'm just waiting to figure out a good excuse to use it. Yeah. I'll show you. Somebody said, I'm working on a project for somebody, and they have, like, whiskey barrels. And so they said, how can we use whiskey barrels? And so I thought you could make it into a seat and put a place to put your feet. So you just simply cut out the side of the whiskey barrel. (laughs) So I don't know what I'm going to do. but And then that's another one. You could sit sideways in it. I don't know. Oh, nice. That's an awesome Kind of obvious ideas at the moment. But, yeah. Well, it's nice to have like a collection of your thoughts too, right? So you go back a couple weeks later and you go, "Oh, that's what I was thinking yeah. about," or "That's a new project to build." I tend to, um, I tend to scotch tape a lot of things into my books too. <laughs> I'll, I'll just staple things directly to the page. You know, if like a, like this is just business cards. I just staple them right to the page. So my books start to get fat with all kinds of notes and stuff. Yeah. Well, Laura, how about you? You have your book already. Any idea what you're going to use it for yet? Um, no, not yet. I might just do the same thing that he does, and whenever I have stuff at school, I'm like, I'm listening, just cross it in it and say <laughs> Like a doodle sketchbook, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I find, too, that when I get a new sketchbook, it's like, it's so new, you, like, almost don't want to use it at first. Yeah. It's like pure, you know? You gotta get That's over that hurdle. Get the first make page. notebook is still blank. <laughs> yeah, I, get, I got over that fear a long time ago. I just dig right in and just start drawing stuff. I also have a, I have a bad habit. Some of my sketchbooks, I have this habit of just opening up to any page and starting to draw. So when I'm looking yeah. for something important, I can never find it. Yeah, so I my really notebook, you like thumb through it. My old notebooks start to end up with little tabs sticking off of them because like that's the page that has this important job dimensions on it. This is the page that has the notes mm-hmm. for that meeting on it, and they're just randomly placed. They're not necessarily in sequential order. I'll just open my notebook and just start drawing like I just did the X and the O, and that'll become something. <laughs> and so my older notebooks have like folded over corners and tabs of blue scotch tape sticking out of everywhere. So it's well, a habit I try to break. I just try to keep things linearly, but I never do. I'm just I'm a, bit of a, I'm a bit of a scatterbrain when it comes to trying to keep notes. So I was going to ask maybe how you keep notes organized, but maybe you you don't actually. <laughs> I do. I what what are some good practices, I guess? I, the taping stuff in is pretty good. Um, this is my Muji notebook from Muji. I got it at the airport a couple months ago. Yeah. This is in my back pocket. and uh, 
just all kinds of like notes and stuff on that. So it was really important to go in that book, particularly. This is the one. Yeah, this is always in my back pocket. So. Yeah. Eventually, if there's something real important, I tear it out and I stick it in the other notebook. So, Courtney, Meg, how is the gluing process coming along? Uh, are we the it's, next step. Yeah, I think we're pretty much ready for the next step. And we had one question. I know we just went over it, but a camper, um, Jimmy, can you go over what kind of glue um, to use again? Uh, one of the campers is is asking for us to go over it sure. one more time. Uh, again, I would use a. It's called PVA is the technical term, and a lot of times you'll see it referred to as jade glue, which is sort of like the ancient term for the bookbinding book world. Okay. Yeah, jade glue or PVA, and uh, you can get it obviously at any craft shop. It's really inexpensive, and you know what's good about having jade glue or PVA around? It works really good for fabric and leather and a lot of things, and it's not as toxic as say crazy glue. I mean, you could. Even, I've even used PVA to glue back ceramic. It oh. gives you a little bit of time to find like if you broke a piece of ceramic and you want to put it back together or a piece of plaster it gives you a few minutes to kind of get it in place it's not like you know with crazy glue you got one shot if you don't get it in the right spot you're <laughs> yeah. then your fingers get like glued together you know you yeah. gotta like break them apart and you're like <laughs> yeah. yeah that's why if you notice in my videos I leave in this little silly knick-knacky stuff in my videos when I get the PVA on my fingertips, you roll it off and it comes off right away. Mm -hmm. So in my videos, you'll see me like doing like this with my hands quickly just to get rid of the glue. Because oh, nice. you don't want to leave a fingerprint on the book. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? If you get the glue on your fingers, you'll leave a fingerprint on the book, which will rub off if you get it fast enough. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Should we take the clamps off? Yeah. So can you help us kind of guide us through the next couple of steps? I think we, I think it's pretty right. much well, dry. All right, you use the super cloth on the back of that. So you kind of use like a, if you were going to, were you planning on putting bolts in this book? Yes. We have the Do you have a hollow tube? And okay. Um, bolts. Can, we don't have the hollow, but we have a lovely drill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right on. Well, it's difficult to drill through paper. That's why in my video I use a hollow tube. You can't use a regular drill for paper because all it will do is just make a big, knotty, bumpy hole. Ah. Do you have do you have like a sacrificial book? You could see what happens when it doesn't work. That's what a lot of times I tell my students. I tell my students just see see what to expect when it goes wrong. So okay. this way you know what to expect. Simply so yeah, if you I guys have we'll, a if you have an old notebook lying around or even anything like even just like a like a catalog like a like an old catalog from a company or something sitting around, use a regular drill and see what happens just to get a reference point. And if it okay. works, you know sometimes it works. It all depends on the uh, the, the strength of the paper that you're drilling. A lot of times if you're going to use a regular drill without the hollow tube method, you need to clamp the whole block of paper between two pieces of wood really solidly. This will keep the paper from expanding and jumping all over the place because that's what happens. The okay. drill bit goes through the paper and it just pushes it everywhere. It doesn't necessarily remove it. I see. Yeah, so if you clamp it, the paper has no choice but to be pulled out by the drill bit. This is all like at a very mo molecular level. <laughs> so, Courtney, I think we're going to have somebody bring up a, uh, a metal tube for you and uh, some books, and we can do it. Uh, we can test the theory of the drill bit. Perfect. I think we have a tube with a book. Oh, okay, there's a book. This is. <laughs> and so, underneath, should we put a block of wood as well? Oh, uh, yes, of course, yeah. Okay. I mean, if you wanted to experiment with drilling through a piece of wood into the paper, into another piece of wood, it's real important that you clamp it all together securely, like maybe to the edge of the table, for instance. You have those squeeze clamps. Safety you know. first. Yeah, safety first. Yeah. <laughs> I, I sometimes, uh, this gets a little bit uh, um, surreal, but I tell my students, I say, imagine yourselves being really tiny and being standing right next to the paper and the drill bit contacting one another and just imagine what that would look like if you were that small and able to watch it like the way you'd watch a building being built this kind of helps you see exactly what might happen or at least imagine what could happen Overall. that makes sense? <laughs> yeah. like yeah. I, I had a really close friend of mine who, who, who has since passed away he was a much older gentleman his name was Harry Yang and if you google Harry Yang you could see the bot Harry Yang would would encourage his students to think and the, what he would do is he would put objects inside of glass bottles so if you did an image Google search of Harry Yang you would see some of his bottles Harry a e -N -G was his last name he's, he's since passed away several years ago but Harry would make these bottles and he would always tell me and encourage me 
use the, the your third eye is is like your imagination, like what what you could imagine to be, what's happening where you can't see. So I mean, Harry was a big inspiration to me, and again, he puts things in bottles to encourage people to think. Like, how did I do that? Mm -hmm. And like getting a boat would, in there, or like, what do you mean by that, Jimmy? Like, um, if you could do a quick Google search, you'll see he would put a deck okay. of cards with a bullet through it and a knot. He did a lot of deck of cards. He did a lot of like knots. He would literally put a whole deck of cards, and through the deck of cards, he would drill a hole using a hollow drill bit. He and I discovered that at the same time, actually, but uh, you know, we, we were able to talk about our notes. But uh, I was drilling book bindings, and he was drilling decks of cards to use in his in his sculptures. He, I called them sculptures, his bottle sculptures. And um, he would uh, he would take a deck of cards, for instance, drill a hole right through the middle of it with a hollow drill bit, and then put a nut and bolt on it inside of a bottle. So you have a full deck of cards with a hole through the middle of it with a bolt, <laughs> and none of them seem to fit through the hole of the bottle. And how the hell he get it in there? Okay, this let's is, try. We'll try to show. <laughs> this is some of his stuff. Um, you were able to find something? Oh, yeah, can you guys see that okay? We're trying to do a screen yeah. show with yeah. like a tablet. But uh, so there's one of them. There's a second one with a wine bottle and deck of cards right there. Cool. Yeah, it's a full deck of cards. But I said, how would you get a deck of cards in the bottle when, when we were first becoming friends? And he would say, he would hand me a card and go, do you think this could go inside the bottle? I'm like, yeah, you'd roll it up and stick it in the hole. He goes, well, there you just came up with the answer. <laughs> oh, wow. He'd stick them in one at a time and then unfurl them and put them back into the box, which he would take apart and then reassemble inside the bottle. Wow. wow. Is that how yeah. they like put boats in bottles too? They put in the pieces and then put it all together inside the bottle? Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Crazy. And then in, in some of his sculptures, Nick, you'll see... Uh, I don't know how we got off the subject. We'll get back on the book in a second. But in some of his sculptures, he has a baseball inside of like a mayonnaise jar. And the, ball, the baseball is obviously maybe a half inch larger in diameter than right. the opening mayonnaise jar. And I say, how did you get that in there? And he go, did you ever see a baseball being hit in slow motion? What happens? It deforms. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And he goes, well, that's what I do. I deform the baseball and I put it in the bottle. But I, he doesn't hit it at 90 miles an hour. I don't know. He had a method, which he never shared with me. Yeah. <laughs> So was, so was Harry pretty influential to you, Jimmy, kind of figuring out how to build things and just really kind of thinking? Kind of, kind of uh, pushing yeah. you to think about different, different ideas, it sounds like. Absolutely, yeah. And so uh, Harry would stay with me from time to time. He was from, from your area. He's from Northern California. And Harry would stay with me every once in a while in New York. And when he would come, I'd always try and have a bottle ready for him, a bottle that I made, yeah. and, and trick him. So uh, I was doing a lot of mold <laughs> making at the time. And I, put a, I made a mold of a light bulb. And I put the mold into a Snapple bottle, and then I filled the mold up, and I was able to do a rotocast. So I had a hollow light bulb mold, and I broke, wow. I cut, I cut off the latex mold and pulled it out of the bottle, and I had a perfect casting of a light bulb inside the bottle. Yeah. Wow. And then I was wow. able to break the bottom of the light bulb off like a real bottom, you know, like that Edison bottom, the copper yeah, bottom. Yeah. And I stuck it through the thing; it fit right inside the bottle, and I glued it on top of the casting. So when he got there, and I showed him a, a light bulb inside of a bottle, he, you know, I can't curse, but he was just like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> and he was, he was totally yeah. blown away. And yeah. the bottle, because it was a nice fresh casting, I used Smoothcast 300, and it was bright white. It made like a nice tinkling sound, like it was a real light bulb. But after a day, the, the light bulb got a flat spot in it because it was such a thin wall. <laughs> and that's when he came oh. to me. He goes, what is this? I go, it's casting <laughs> So he, uh, he, he, was, he was impressed that I was able to kind of trick him. I, 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 he said, he goes, is the light bulb real? And I said, is it? That's what I said. To him. <laughs> so, so we were able to kind of, we always tried to top one another. But he was a very big influential part. I mean, I still hear his voice in my head when I'm talking about, when I'm thinking through problem solving and stuff. So. Very cool. So did you guys get ready to drill a hole? Yes, we just drilled the hole. Can it was so quiet. <laughs> we, oh, we muted it because we, we, it was going to be super loud. <laughs> oh, and did it go through cleanly? Do you think you'd be able to – is it like all puffy and weird or it, is it clean? It is a little bit. It's a little puffy. I think for our book it will be okay, but I see what you, you're saying about yeah. that it kind of pushes the paper outwards. So. Yeah. yeah, and we all put right. one uh, thin piece of wood on top first when we started it's drilling it too. Hmm. Okay. But I think it'll yeah, be okay just for our first book anyways. Okay, yeah, all right, so then go for it. 
Okay. And then in that case, since, since you're gonna, I would drill what I did in my video, I drill them all together. So position the pack of paper under the wood where you need it. And then are, are you going to cut a, a, a one inch strip like I did with my book? So you have like that hinged area? That looks good. Yeah. How, so how did you do oh, that? Oh, of the wood. Yeah, this is a, its own individual piece of wood. Mm. So, Laura, what did you do? Because yours looked a little bit different. I like your style too with the leather. Um, oh, you know, so kind of yeah. walk us through what your steps were. Um, so on his first video, I don't know if it was shown. Um, he did a thing with when he made the rainbow book, and yeah. he made like a spine. And I had to do that because I didn't have an extra piece of paper. I mean, uh, I didn't have an extra piece of wood, okay. so I couldn't do that flap thing, and I couldn't cut it. So I just kind of mixed his two videos together to make. Oh, very my cool. Book. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very good. So did you use the leather with like the paper, or can you show us kind of close up what is oh, your it's kind binding of, it's look like? Ugly. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's um, great. I actually just went around my house. It's kind of hard to show. Ah, I can't really show it. Mm -hmm. I went oh, around I my house that. and I just found like a hard, thickish cardboard cover of like a notebook, and I just cut it out of the old notebook. And I glued that down to make a spine. It was semi-hard. It was okay. really homemade-ish. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, it's like I said, when you do anything by hand, it's all about just collecting experience. Mm -hmm. And so next time you make a book, you'll do it a little bit different. Yeah. It's all about collecting experiences, that's all. And using them mm -hmm. as reference for your next uh, ambition. So. Perfect. So, guys, if you want to, do you want to try and cut a strip of wood off at the end? Are those two pieces of wood you have the same size? Yes. Yes. Right now, did you want to try and cut maybe an inch off the back of one of them? Yeah, we could do that. Because uh, that, that, that's quarter inch paneling. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like we I said, be able usually. To use this to cut it. Uh, you could. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. If you guys want to experiment, do you have a steel okay. ruler? Yeah, uh, we have something ruler like. It's very hard. Well, it's real, it just, I'm just going to give a little fair warning that I give to my students. It's really important that whenever you use a razor or an X-Acto knife, use it against a steel ruler. Not aluminum, not plastic, not wood. Steel, a steel, really? a steel ruler will not it's, – it's very, it's very unlikely that a razor blade will ride up a steel ruler. But did you ever cut with, a, with an X-Acto knife a few times and then all of a sudden the razor blade catches the wood or the, the plastic mm -hmm. or whatever it is and then it goes mm -hmm. across your finger? That's not good. <laughs> yeah. cutting, cutting your finger is bad. Safety first. But, Safety first. <laughs> yeah, so if you, I mean, but it, if, that being said, if you want to try and cut it against the plastic, just be really careful. Got it. Laura, how did it go with you? Did you try using an X-Acto blade for anything, or? Uh... Uh, the wood was kind of big. Like, you can see the, it kind of hangs off. Like, there's a big space between the paper and the wood. Yep. So I tried to cut it so I could make, so it would be more even with the paper and so I could use it as a spine. Mm -hmm. And I tried using an X-Acto knife, but it wasn't cutting very well. I guess I'm just not very experienced with an X-Acto knife. So I just covered it up with, there's like markings, you can't see them though, because I covered it up with this magazine thing. Right on. Yeah. That's cool. Well, guys, the, the trick to cutting a piece of wood with a razor blade, or at least I yeah. should say a piece of paneling, is several light passes with the razor blade. Just make sure you keep staying inside the same cut. So if you do mm -hmm. 10 passes on the top side of the wood and then 10 passes mm -hmm. on the bottom side of the wood, and then it'll still be together, but you'll be able to snap it, control. You'll be able to snap it right where you want it to. So Perfect. give it a couple of light, and, and when you make your passes, go slowly, because if the razor blade does jump your straight edge, you don't want it to cut your hand. Perfect. That's what I always say. Just slow control. You always want to use a tool slowly enough to know when you're going to get hurt. That's what I like to say. <laughs> That's smart. That's Good. smart. Especially a razor blade. So. We also had one more question um, from Brooklyn about what the super cloth is. Uh, the super cloth, in the instance of your book where you're going to drill and use a bolt, you don't necessarily need it. But the super cloth is the, is the main netting. It's more like a netting than a cloth. And what it does is it, it holds the, the your book body, in this case this is the book body, to the covers. So the super cloth is glued across the back of your book body, which is the chunk of paper, and then it gets trapped between your end pages and your book covers on both sides. So it's the one little webbing that grabs the whole side of the book on each side of your, your paper pack. It basically becomes the hinge, along with the paper on the outside and the inside. But I mean, the paper would ultimately tear, but the super cloth keeps it from tearing. So Jimmy, should that be a certain width? If you know you're going to have, like, say, 
a hundred pages or maybe like half inch thick stack of paper? Should your super cloth be some kind of special dimension, or you just make it big enough so that it actually can make a hinge and? Glue yeah, well, I make it. I, I make it go across the back of my paper pack, and then I, I let it overhang about two inches at least on both sides. Mm -hmm. Oh, at least two inches. Okay, so it's a pretty yeah. good, pretty good amount. Yeah, like if you saw my first book video, you'll know, you'll see me. You'll see how it kind of in, laying it down. gets incorporated into the uh, into the hinging of the, the the cover. And is there any special way that you to figure out how many pages you want in a book? Do you make a nice round number, or you just grab a stack and say, "Hey, this is how much I want to fold today"? Yeah, I just make it about. I make about a half inch stack typically. In this case, because these pages were all folded over once, so I grab the quarter inch stack, and then once they're all folded against it, it becomes a half inch. Here, this, since they're all individual pages, I grab an actual half inch stack of paper. Is there like a homemade kind of substitution? Because I know there's like a website that sells the super cloth, but if you couldn't like get it from the website, is there anything else that's like similar to it we could use or now? Um, yeah, I mean, I've had students use gauze and try and tell me that it's super cloth. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's, uh, you could, you certainly could. I mean, again, if you're making a book that you're expecting like to last 150 piece. years, if you're making, you know, like a, a Christian manuscript, <laughs> I would say go with the, uh, the good stuff. If you're going to make a book that's just like a little notebook for fun or you're making a gift for somebody as a birthday gift or something, you know, you could improvise. It's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Well, that but actually is an interesting idea. I'm oh, sorry, Jimmy. I was going to ask. Yeah. Those, if you were going to scale this up, make a really big book, would right. the same process apply, or would you do things a little bit differently, maybe, to, to make it stronger? Um, I would do the same process, but you just got to make sure that your your exterior book fabric is going to be something that's going to withstand, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of weight. Because you remember, if you pick up some of these older books, actually, an interesting thing you just reminded me of. My dad was a New York City fireman, and he one day he went into the attic of the firehouse that he worked in in the city and he found these old journals that were like every time they went on a call somebody would use like an ink quill and write in that the page <laughs> the fire was on 96th street That's it was a dog amazing. you know blah 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 it was all handwritten it with the date usually the dates were like typically 1890s 18 1880s and these big giant thick books they were like 2 3 inches thick with a big leather binding. You know, it looks like something you'd see in a horror movie that would, like, hold the key to the plot of the movie. <laughs> and uh, the leather was always dried out, and the binding was always broken off. And I still have these books in my attic. My dad brought home, like, four of them for me to play with, and I scribbled on each page. I probably destroyed them when I was a kid. <laughs> but I still have them, and I always have these thoughts of, like, you know, finding them in my attic at my mother's house and, uh, and, and repairing them. But they need the leather is all worn out and the leather is ripped away. So the binding on, on all these books is that the spine usually tears completely away. And we've all seen that. Old books where the spine tears away. Mm -hmm. So you got to use good fresh leather and uh, you know or, or a leather substitute these days you know that would be as strong and look as cool. I heard that if uh, Wikipedia was a real book the, it, the book would be as up to the moon in height. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> and only half the information would be true. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool that's great yeah I, it's funny in my neighborhood I recently saw a giant stack of uh, mm. like time life oh, like a series yeah. that, that would have been available for sale like in the 80s a stack of uh, invention and technology books from time life I grabbed about 10 of them just bring them back mm. to my shop to kind of look through them <laughs> But the the stack was probably like a thirty six inch wide stack of books that would go on a shelf, and they were all about wow. three quarters of an inch thick, you know, in the oh, series gosh. from one to whatever seventy books. And it's funny, like every one of them is completely obsolete now that you have the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so Meg just got done um, cutting the second piece of wood to try to match the book that you have. Oh, so did you did you snap it yet? No. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you! Oh, did it work? It worked. Oh, yes, yeah. but it's not pretty. I will warn you. <laughs> oh, that's okay. No one's going to see it. Yeah. You you know what you could do? So, do you have a factory cut on the outside edge of that book? On the outside edge of that piece, okay. the little on piece. On this piece, right? This part right here. You yeah. have a factory edge there, and you and you have a factory edge on the other. So that's going to be hidden by the uh, leather. So no one's going to see it. Okay, perfect. You know what I mean? Your your cut is going to be hidden by the leather, glued perfect. on both sides of it. So no one, you really only see it when you open the book all the way, but. If people see four straight lines in every other direction, they'll assume that that one's straight. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, perfect. Like so the, is the, the next bond. step to glue these together then? What um what I would do? Uh yeah, glue glue your hinge. This. Glue your hinge around. You know, I I glue it. In my video, I did it. Doesn't matter what the sequence is, but you want to make sure you have enough leather to wrap completely around yeah. the back. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know what I mean? So you could glue the leather like a half inch onto your full hinge front cover book. Okay. And then glue it onto the back part, and then wrap it around and glue it to the bottom part. But make sure your book body is inside this, so you have the right amount of length. Got it. Okay. Does that makes sense. Yeah, and then once it's all assembled, we put the glue in and then put the clamps on for it to dry with then, the clamps on it. Uh, yeah, and then you drill it after the Got let it. the glue dry for a little while. Mm -hmm. I think we just made an amateur mistake, but I don't think that our screws are going to be thick enough to fit through the leather and the paper. <laughs> Oh, so. that's okay. <laughs> what did you get? Did you did you did you get one inch screws and not one and a quarter inch screws? It looks like you got one inch yeah, screws, or maybe we, three quarter. We uh, scoured the make labs here of what we could find. <laughs> well, it's yeah, always the case. It's more hardware. Yeah. We'll yeah. Too, too short or too long. <laughs> yeah. Too short or too long. It's usually yeah. the case. So, Laura, can I ask you uh, while Courtney and Meg can work on their book? Um, yeah. What other what other stuff have you been into making and? Um, do you think you'll make more books in the future, or is this like a one-off for you? Um, well, if I had the materials or like a wood cutting thing at home or something, I'll probably make one for my cousin because she's in art school, and I can make her like a sketchbook or something, or make like a gift for someone. I think it's pretty neat. Awesome. I mean, first one's ugly, but if I make more, they'll probably end up prettier. And I could right. make them for people. Yeah, if you go with if you go with the first technique, which is just using sure. book board and wrapping mm -hmm. it with like a you know book cover and stuff, that's more accessible for the home desktop razor blade glue straight ruler yeah. that's kind of simple and then you could do the technique where I carve my name in the in the in the book board is so thick you just carve your name in and peel out some of the, the layers yeah I was actually um, I was gonna make like a template kind of thing for my own name so I could do that but then I got this super thick wood and I was like mm -hmm. nope this isn't happening <laughs> but I wanted to make something like that too because I think it's really cool right. yeah it's just we, uh, again it takes practice right? yeah where can we find more of that thin material uh, Jimmy, is that like a hardware store or a craft store? You, you mean the, the actual hard, the, the board for the hard? Yeah, hardware? from that first video that we have, uh, making that, that book right there, it looks almost like it's thick cardboard, really, right? Or is it actually like a wood fiber? Well, you know what? It's a dying art book binding, but in pretty much mostly any city, you'll find somebody that's still hanging on <laughs> to the book binding discipline and you'll find somebody so if you google in your local area book binding you'll find somebody that sells supplies and and that's basically just like um i guess you might call it like display board you know mm -hmm. like uh you know like like mat like double thick mat board like you would yeah. use if you were going to display like a you know piece of artwork or something and how thick and would actually, that be oh, uh, it's about eighth of an inch thick it's about eighth okay. of an inch be a little thinner it's real uh, sometimes it's like if you ever do like a double thick mat board do you ever use like a double thick mat board where yeah. it's like white on both sides? Mm -hmm. that, that'll yeah. work. You can actually get like thin mat board and glue two pieces together to get it strong enough. But they do make specifically, they make book binding, they make book board is what it's called, book board. And it usually, it's like really thick chip board. You know, like the, like the old days when a pizza box would be like have that gray. <laughs> yeah. Like a gray pizza box. Nowadays, old pizza boxes are made out of e-flute. Um, what is but, that? Uh, it's like really thick. Uh, e flute is. I know I'm speaking in commercial terms here. I'll show you. I thought cardboard. I just cut was this cardboard off a box. Cardboard. I just cut this off a box that was just off camera. The this is e flute. Yeah. It's when you have the car. It's corrugated cardboard. Oh. Can you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we can hear. Yeah. It. yeah. Corrugated cardboard is um, is uh, e flute. That's the, uh, the technical term. I can make yep. a pizza box journal. That'd be cool. Yeah, I, actually, you could. <laughs> would you use a used or a unused pizza box, Laura? Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, when I get some pizza, I'll just ask them for an extra box, and they'll just look at me funny. But you know, it's for a good cause. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I mean, I could I could describe, which I don't I don't have an example of right here. But you know what? You guys just held up a catalog, right? Do you have that catalog that you have the whole drill through? Uh, Courtney and Meg, do you guys have that catalog? Sorry, we were muting it so we could yeah. work. <laughs> Are you ignoring us? <laughs> yeah, Can I, we're just show me the very sh show me the very end of that book. The very end, like yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, looking down at the end. Okay, so look at the binding. That's typically called a perfect binding yeah. because it's like 
most catalogs that you get from college or if you're going to get a catalog in the mail is called the perfect binding. Oh, that one. And it's just simply a stack of paper. There we go. Glued at the end. And then you wrap around a thicker sh mm -hmm. piece of paper, oh, and that yeah, becomes okay. your cover. So that's a real simple method to make a book. Um, you just take a stack of paper, you know, again, clamp it, glue it real good, let the glue dry, and then take a thicker piece of paper that's going to wrap around the entire book body, and then glue it right at the end. It's a real simple way to make a nice little journal. And the reason I bring that up is because a lot of my students will take, like, a Tide box, for instance, because like, mm -hmm. it's got cool graphics on it. Yeah, and they'll make a small little pocket journal out of like a, a stack of index cards. So if you take oh, a stack of index awesome. cards and glue one side of it, let it dry, and then wrap like a tied cover box around it, and just glue it at the end, you have a cute little pocket journal that like has cute graphics on it. That's a good idea. Yeah, so that's another simple way to make a book. Mm -hmm. So Jimmy, how many books have you made, you think? All oh, of notebooks and sketchbooks and photo books? It seems like... Uh, Probably about a hundred. Really? More. Yeah. Wow. They're all over the place. I don't know. I, every once in a while, I like, I'll move a piece of furniture. I'll find a book I made, like a photograph <laughs> book of my dogs. <laughs> they, they just, I don't know. At this point, they're all over. Do you like chron uh, put them in like a chronological order? Have you labeled them like one, two, fifty? Nah. nah. Not necessarily, because they're all different sizes and stuff. Oh, okay. You know, I, uh, I occasionally, like if I'm going to do a photo book, and I don't want to waste a lot of ink because nobody wants to waste ink, especially when you have to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I would print out like an 8.5 by 11 page like this, and I would tile my images. So boom, boom. So however mm -hmm. many images would fit on that page, I'd print it out, and then each one of those images becomes a spread. So I've made books that, is like, that are actually as big as this. You know? Wow. Because if I make one printed page, I could print like six images on it. You and then that image off. gets folded in half, and so on and so on. I've actually made books that were like this big, like little tiny books like this big. <laughs> Did you actually use them, or were just a, an experiment to see if you could do it? You no, know, just an experiment. Like for my friend's birthday, I made her a little book. I made her a little book like this of, of images that she took. She was actually, a friend of mine was, was, was experimenting with photography, and she was a little insecure about it, so she kept sending me images that she was taking. And uh, what she didn't know is I was collecting them all, and then I made a book for her for her birthday. Aww. Aww, that's cute. Of pictures that just she took. So it was cool. So Courtney, How you guys doing there? Along? Good. So we just clamped it all together. Um, so we cut out the piece, um, and we put the leather attached to both of it. Right. Um, Watch your eyes with that clamp there. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, what <laughs> clamps do you recommend? So we have um, like Whoa. this long clamp, and then we also have these tiny ones. Which ones do you use for your books? Um, well, I use those. I like to use those antique screw clamps because you can get a lot of good pressure out of them, and you can kind of because they they uh, the, the antique screw clamps are the ones in my videos. You can get like a long pressure along a long edge, a lot of pressure along a straight edge, a parallel edge. Uh, but then I would definitely, I know you guys have limited means right where you are, but I would definitely use two chunks of wood and then clamp it between that whole thing. Oh, okay. I would use like three quarter inch wood. In the video, I happen to have a lot of bamboo plywood laying around, so I used the bamboo plywood. Bamboo plywood is a really strong one. So have two three quarter inch pieces of, of plywood or bamboo plywood, I would use that to clamp along the long edge. Does that also protect the... Sorry, does it also protect the binding, though, from those, like, clamp marks? Uh, absolutely, yeah, you get an even pressure, definitely. I mean, it'll wear out of the leather eventually. It'll wear away, but that's, that's a really good point, Nick. So, Jimmy, are you also going to, uh, to the Maker Faire uh, New York that's coming up? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. be there. I mean, we kind of have, like, a loose plan going right now where I'm going to have, like, a booth. I'm going to be on display making uh, different things. Different stuff like, you know, whatever. Whatever. If somebody like calls out from the audience, make a boat. So I'll make a boat on the band so <laughs> take requests. Yeah, no, so I'd be like your, making uh, like little wooden ball? toys and stuff. You'll but have Nick, a bandsaw with you? Was that right? Uh, yeah. Sherry and Nick right now are making plans to try and have some tools there for me. And uh, Nick Normals, he's making the – he's arranging the shop. So we're going to probably have, uh, you know, a couple of small power tools and – Growing up as a kid, believe it or not, my dad limited me to the bandsaw. He's like, you can only use this dangerous tool, not all of them. <laughs> so when I was like a seven, eight-year-old kid, my dad started me on the bandsaw. 
And uh, actually yeah, actually, this is a really funny story. Me and my cousin would get together. My cousin's my same age, and his father and my father were brothers. And so we, they both had the same exact set of tools in their, in their different homes. Because so when my cousin and I would get together, we weren't allowed to turn the power tools on. The mm -hmm. power switch for the shop was like unreachable. And uh, so my cousin would turn the wheel on the bandsaw by hand, and I would use the bandsaw. So he would, by <laughs> hand, he would be turning the pulley. We would be like seven or eight years old or maybe six or seven. <laughs> and he's turning the pulley on the bandsaw, and I'm pushing the wood through it. Wow. And vice versa, when it was his turn to cut, I would turn the wheel. And it was really, was thinking back now, it's so funny how like we were able to like hotwire the system, the old school Is that way, but, more like, or less dangerous than if you had used the electricity? <laughs> <laughs> Probably less because, you know, like you know, the, the electricity just keeps going. You know, this like yeah. literally like every time you he'd grab the wheel and turn it, it would get like a nice couple, like couple of millimeters of a cut. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so ultimately my dad let me use the bandsaw. So that's the, the one tool I have the longest experience with is the bandsaw. So... I told Sherry I could make anything on the bandsaw, pretty much anything. If the, if I only was if I was stranded on an island with one tool, I would need a bandsaw <laughs> and electric. <laughs> or my cousin. Or your cousin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. So, yeah, So that's why I said a bandsaw I could get a lot done. At least you know, like in limited within limited means at at like a camp fair site kind of thing. Well, what other kind of tools do you use, Jimmy? Uh, do you use like? Uh, machine shop with like a lathe and a mill? Do you stick to wood? Do you like welding? I do, yeah, I do have a machine lathe. I have a 1950 South Bend machine lathe, which I bought here in Chinatown. It's old oh, and used. Oh, South Bend, that's nice. Yeah, it's really cool. It's about 36 inches, and I get a lot done on that. I have a, a milling machine, which is a newer milling machine. It's like a grizzly. It's like inexpensive, but it works. It does the job. And uh, again, being in Manhattan, I have limited space. I really have my heart set on a... Uh, a bridge port, but they're just too big and heavy to get down the basement. So yeah, <laughs> would you have uh, like access to three phase power, or would you convert it to a? Uh... I have I have two twenty, not three phase. Yeah, I would have to convert it to a two twenty. Yeah. But ultimately, uh, I mean, I plan I have plans of building a big shop. I have property in the country in New York State, so I'm gonna probably build a, a barn up there one of these years. Move most of your tools back. Yeah, I'll I'll can I'll get them all in one big giant corral, and I'll have all the power I need. <laughs> then I'll take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> from my shop in the country. Sounds like peeking the brain, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, so in my shop I have, uh, I also have a, a table saw, which uh, I happen to have a, what's called a, a Rockwell Unisaw, which is about from 1965. And mm -hmm. um, I have a cross cut sled on it. So with the table saw I could pretty much also do any kind of straight cut, long cuts, short cuts, and uh, angled cuts. I mean, there's lots of techniques where you could pretty much do a lot of the work on the uh, mm -hmm. on the table saw, and that's what you see me use in this book video, where I kind of do sh quick cuts and then cross cuts. And it sounds like you kind of have uh, a couple of the older tools. Is there something about the way tools are made back in the day that you like, or you just find really good tools, really good deals? Like, how, what's up with a that? A little bit of both. Yeah, I just like I, I'm nostalgic for old tools. I have uh, it's in storage again when I have my master plan put together. There, I'll have it ready to use. But I have a 1900 uh, bandsaw made in Chicago that I got from a, a, an old school in Harlem. They were throwing it at, they were throwing it out, and so I went up there with my pickup truck. It weighed so much, my truck was doing a wheelie. Literally, my front wheels <laughs> wow. like like off the ground. It's a big giant bandsaw with 36 inch wheels, and uh, it's like something you'd see in a shipyard. It's it's incredible. Whoa. Yeah. And uh, I have it in storage right now. You, you see it on my, my Facebook. And when I did the show Hammered, we had it on set. And so if you see old clips of Hammered, you'll see me using it. It's really, really incredible piece of machinery. Um, I just love old tools just because they're usually typically stronger. And they have a little bit of a history to them. I always like, I kind of have this like, uh, I imagine that the, the, all the experience this tool has will help me through whatever it is I'm doing. It's just like a little mystical fantasy. <laughs> Very cool. So why were they made better? Can you talk about that? I'm just curious. Was it like better castings and, or were they just more material or they were just heavier? So they're more solid? Yeah, well, just the way everything in the world is manufactured in, you know, around 1900 they made it, you know, they'd make a milk carton out of cast iron just they didn't want it to break. Okay. And then somebody said, hey, you know, we could save money and make it out of paper. And they go, hey, that's a good idea. And so now it's made out of paper, which it will break because they just test its limits. They go like, Ah, well, you know, it just has to last for five days until the milk goes bad. And so, like, all right, make it out of paper. And in the old days, you know, you'd use a milk jug for 70 other things after it was used for milk. And uh, it's the same thing with tools. They said, if we make it out of cast iron, it'll last forever and nobody will buy another one. If we make it out of tin, 
It'll we'll start buy to one in two out. years. It'll break. We'll buy, another, and then... <laughs> we'll buy another one in two years. Exactly. Yeah. So it's just the same. Like around the seventies is when tools started to get really cheap. Ah, uh, and you know, like I, I have tools with castings on them. They instead of casting them out of cast iron, they cast them out of like zinc or pot metal, and you drop a knob on the floor, and the little thing prong breaks off. You know, yeah. where if you have one from nineteen hundred, you could throw it against the wall, and it'd just come back <laughs> to you and say. You know, throw me again. Your wall might break first, yeah. Exactly. So, it's uh, it's it's also I love I love uh, the nostalgia of old tools just because of the way they look. Like my my printing press that is on one of my videos on my YouTube channel is just so cool. I I, I haven't printed with it yet, but that's going to be my third video in that series. I have it ready. It's getting ready for printing. Um, it's an old printing press uh, made in 1911, and it's just it's just the coolest object I think I own right now. But uh, I got to find a shelter for it. It's still in my driveway because it weighs two thousand pounds. I have to move it now. <laughs> That's a little heavy. <laughs> yeah. Well, it really weighs. It weighs fifteen hundred pounds. In my first video, I move it, but that was before it actually worked, and I didn't care. You know, like if I dropped it or anything. Now it works, and I'm going to be more fragile with my next move. Yeah. So I got to move it properly. The first video, I just strap it to a piece of wood and tilt it backwards and shove it on my truck. But now <laughs> that all the now all the moving parts are working all again. All dialed in, kind of working. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I want to uh, move it with a little bit more care. So, is that the next project, or what? What is the next big project for you coming up? Um, I'm trying to think. Actually, this weekend, if anybody in the audience is in Nashville, this weekend I'm going to be in Nashville. I'm going to be involved in a bar building competition at the cool. music, the Music City Festival, barbecue. And music festival, music. Mm -hmm. I, it's, I, I've, I've heard seven people called seven different things. Music City Barbecue and Music <laughs> Festival, I think, is really what it all comes down to. And at that place, I'm going to be building a bar. I'm going to be building a bar out of wooden, like uh, natural timber, against somebody that's going to be building one out of metal. Oh, cool! I'm not allowed to use a chainsaw, and he's not allowed to use a welder. So we're both <laughs> oh. have a very difficult time. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's a public event, and the fire marshal won't allow either. Oh. So. <laughs> mix it for a so, challenge, right? Kind of mix exactly, up. Exactly. Exactly. It's going to be like John Henry against John Henry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, totally his, his way, metal though. mine is wood, yeah. and we'll see. Yeah. Uh, say it again, Nick. You broke up. I said you're you're totally going to win that competition, though. So I can't wait to see what it looks like. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we'll see. I hope I win. Yeah. <laughs> so Courtney and Meg, how's the uh, how's the book coming along? Good. We just so, uh, uh, drilled our first uh, nut in there. So if you can see. Oh, right on. Do you plan on using three, I hope? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was going to say, because you're on. off center. <laughs> yes. Right on. You, you found screws that go through the whole binding? Yes. Yes, we did. Oh, good. You see, the good thing about that binding, if you didn't want to glue it together the way I did and the way you did, you could change pages out. For instance, a lot of my students do that method and they, they change out portfolio pages. Oh, okay. So uh, if you wanted to do that, and you could set up like a, a hole puncher, like a, an office hole punch, mm -hmm. and to punch it at a regular intervals mm -hmm. so that if you were going to use a different piece of paper, you could just punch all your holes. You didn't necessarily need to drill them. But of course yeah. you would need to drill through the wood and leather. That would so be that's something great. to keep in mind. That seems like it would be really useful. Yep. Well, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up pretty soon. But do you want to have any more questions, uh, Courtney or Meg, for Jimmy about kind of the next couple steps, um, how to finish it up, or are you just gonna put two more uh, bolts in there and call it done? Yeah. Where else can we kind of take this to to spruce it up a bit for the cover and, and things like that? Well, you know, one thing you could do a lot of times when I make my book body again, you gotta have a shop full of tools. Sometimes I'll make my book body like this, and I'll. I'll sand, I'll sand the, the corners round, or I could even bandsaw, like a, you could bandsaw a funny shape on the end of your book. I know we talked about having it overhang, but it doesn't necessarily have to overhang. You could take your whole book and put it on a sander, the front edge, and get it all so it's like the paper and the wood is all on the same level. That looks mm -hmm. nice, too. Nice. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things you could do. And in your books on the inside covers, did I see you have like a design on the inside? Uh -huh. Well, this hand, this handmade book. These are called your end pages. The, the handmade uh, with the with the cardboard cover. I use end pages. They're a catalog from a, a gun catalog that I had. Oh, cool! They're cool. just like catalog pages. They're like a, obviously a little bit thicker, 
because mm -hmm. it's a high-end catalog, so it's a little bit thicker, and uh, they're slicker. So I just yeah. use them as my end pages. I improvised that while I was shooting that video. I realized I wasn't thinking about my end pages. I looked around, and I grabbed the catalog that was sitting there. <laughs> I just tore out two pages. So that's called end pages, and that, that traps your, your, your super cloth between here and the book cover. And that's what typically end pages are. In this book, I don't have end pages because you don't necessarily need them. Right. You're not using right. super cloth to begin with, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right. So we just have the thing hanging out at the back. Very cool. I, I know you guys use super cloth, but it's okay. You could just snip wherever it's hanging out. No one will see it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So Katie, Kate and Laura, uh, do you have any more questions for Jimmy before we wrap things up? Um, I know your book is pretty much done. looks really good. So. <laughs> um, I was just... I think we covered it already, but I was just going to ask any other kinds of books that are more like for the layman who doesn't really have a lot of tools. But you did we mention got, the one where you just tape on the cover. So You guys want to see a really quick book that I show my students? I, you just reminded me. I'm yeah. glad you asked this question. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm going to tear a page out of my book. <laughs> <isn't quite> <laughs> so there, I just tear that page. <laughs> <laughs> I made the book so good it didn't tear cleanly. So um, hold on a second. I'll demonstrate this like this. So you have a regular piece of paper, right? Mm-hmm. You fold it in half like that once. <laughs> and you fold it again and again. So you fold it into quarters, right? So now it's folded into quarters. Mm -hmm. Now with your exacto knife, you cut out just the two middle pages. So you end up with something like this, right? Uh -huh. Okay. And then you go like this, you fold it back on itself. And then you fold it around. And now you have an you have an eight page spread. Let me see, I don't have my sharpie on there. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll label the pages. You got one, you got two, three, four, five, six, seven, and your back cover is eight. So here, look at that. So out of one printed piece of paper you can get the cover. Two and three, four and five, six and seven, and eight. <laughs> cool. And that's one wow. piece of paper. That's I think so that's nice. the kind of book I can make. <laughs> yeah. I think in 20 seconds, Jimmy just made like the world's fastest book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then when I do that, I, again, you lay it out in Photoshop or Illustrator, and then you print your book out. You, you pre-fold it. You, you, you pre-fold all your lines, and then you give it a light misting of spray glue. You mm -hmm. fold it back up, you press it, and then you trim your three sides, and you have a perfect little eight-page book. Wow, very nice. That's so cute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, you. I'm so glad you asked that question. I completely forgot to talk about that. <laughs> You're welcome. Awesome. Well, uh, Jimmy, any closing comments for the campers watching? And uh... I think the most important thing to remember whenever you do bookbinding is a, is a good example of this uh, discipline is just keep making them again and again and again and each time you make it you get better at it than the previous time you did it. That's it. It's real important to remember that. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks to Kate and uh, Laura for uh, joining us from uh, from Google in Austin. Uh, and Laura, good luck with the senior year in high school. Uh, Thank you. And then uh, Courtney <laughs> and Meg, I hope you'll keep us posted with uh, the update from your, uh, your book binding when you're all done. Definitely. Yes. Big thanks to Jimmy for joining us today from Maker Camp. Uh, it's awesome having him hang out and uh, showing us some of your, your cool uh, methods for bookbinding. Uh, Thank you very much, Nick. Book. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Cool. So, uh, campers, we're going to have uh, the junior counselor hangout in about half an hour from now. So, as always, if you want to join that hangout and you haven't uh, let us know already, uh, go ahead and leave a, a comment under this post and we'll add you to our circles and send the invite out in about half an hour from now. And um, we are looking forward to the last week of Maker Camp. So, if you haven't, uh, check out some of the videos that we posted up. Uh, Adam Savage, Lady Ada, a bunch of the archive videos on YouTube. Uh, and Jimmy, where can we find your YouTube videos, actually? It's a good reminder. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm making some exclusive content for Make, a blog, of course. And uh, But my stuff is on YouTube.com forward slash Jimmy DiResta. And my awesome. uh, my URLs are in progress right now. So if you go to JimmyDiResta.com, you'll see some half-baked template that has nothing to do with me. So <laughs> Stay tuned, right? You're, it's coming yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. You, you'll see it's like half content of mine, half content of somebody who knows. I don't know. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, all, it's all in progress. Maybe this week I'll have it tied up.
Awesome. awesome. Well, again, thanks everyone for the hangout, and I uh, look forward to uh, seeing the progress and going home and make my own book actually tonight. So, awesome. Right on. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Thank you all.